Bibles to James chapter 3. This is our text for this evening, James 3, verses 1 to 12. And I'll read it and then pray. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this, your word. And I do ask now simply that you would, by your spirit, help us to receive it. Lord, that we would hear the very words that you have for us, your word, which is true in all of its content, in all of its ways, for you are true in all of your ways. Lord, simply I ask that you would speak your message to each one. Open our hearts to receive your word, that we would glorify you as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we continue in the book of James, undoubtedly you will all agree that we have in this past, what is soon to be two years, become quite accustomed to warnings and calls for vigilance. Of course, due to covid an obvious one, hands, face, space. You remember this moniker that told us to be careful, to be actually careful due to the danger and thus to be vigilant. Well, this text is a warning. It is a call to vigilance. And the danger, in fact, the terrible, sinful power that we are warned about in this text is the power of human speech, here described as the tongue. We've just seen, if you look into the last verses of chapter 2, you'll know them. These are well-known verses. Roger preached on this last week, where we saw that faith produces works. It always produces works, and a faith without works is not a true faith. The connection between that text and this is, as he has now made that point, James is going to continue and talk of the works that faith produces. Hear the works of our words, and thus our speech. The first section in verses 1 and 2 introduce the theme, and he does so with a particular example, which then will be made into a general example. So look with me at verse 1. James starts by saying, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So you see straight away the particular example. He's talking to those who are wannabe teachers. Those who potentially and likely are looking to the pulpit, those who teach the word and thinking, yes, I'd like to do that, but perhaps are not ready, are not yet qualified, and thus are too eager to want the status of a teacher. And he warns them and says, not many of you should become teachers. And you're going to see throughout this text, notice he says, my brothers. James does not teach here in this text from a lofty position of a sort of harsh authoritarianism. He says to them, my brothers, 
It's an affectionate term. He's saying, my brothers and sisters in Christ. We must note that before we proceed. But he says, not many of you should become teachers. He puts a warning to those who would quickly rush to the, wanting that office, that role, and says, what? For we know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. In other words, what he's saying here is due to the nature of the teaching ministry, one that is in with words, one has a greater capacity, a greater danger of sinning. Hence, the strictness here is really meaning that we will be judged with a greater judgment because we have a greater responsibility to teach the word faithfully. Hence, we will be judged with a greater judgment. Here is his warning. If you feel you should rush to be a teacher, and I have heard a, a, a man once say to me who had worked well on his physique, and he was in Christian circles, and he said, now I've perfected the body, I'm now going to be a pastor. Yes, he really did. And sadly, I don't share it as for the humor merely. I share it really because of the sadness. That he saw it was a, just an obvious next step that he would take to now becoming a pastor. As far as I'm aware, he's not yet a pastor. And that was many years ago. It's a solemn and serious call to teach God's word. Thus, a serious warning. But he does not end with leaders. This is merely the beginning of his warning here about the danger of words. See in verse 2, here the reason one should not rush to be a teacher. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle or control his whole body. The reason of the danger is because we all sin in speech. Hence, one must not rush. One must not seek for status and teaching office. And then look with me at verses 3 to 6. Now he goes on, and he was, he's going from a particular to a general point for all people about the dangers of the tongue of human speech. And here he shows the disproportionate, destructive power of the tongue. In verse 3, we see his first illustration. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies. He's speaking here of the harness that we put on horses, the bit that goes in their mouths with which we direct and control them. Though the bit is only small, it has a great power for it directs the entire course of this animal. Have a look then at the next in verse 4. He moves on to the next illustration. He's making a similar point here that something so small has such a great influence. Here he now turns to a naval illustration. Look at the ships. He's talking here of large vessels that are seafaring ships. Although they are large and are driven by strong winds, what are they guided by? He says, they are guided by a very small rudder or steering oar, wherever the will of the pilot directs. Again, something so relatively small, comparatively small, directs where and controls this great ship. Verse 5, so also, he says, given these two examples of something small that has great influence, so also is the tongue. A small member here refers to it as a small part of the body, yet it boasts of great things. And it's a legitimate boast in a sense. Because our mouths have an incredible influence over the rest and entire course of our lives. Think about it. Our thoughts, our imaginings, our hopes, our plans, intricately and intimately involved in all these things, are our tongues and our words. So indeed, the tongue is a small member, yet boasts of great things. And then you'll see, it's not just positive here, the real emphasis is negative. Look again at verse 5. He continues, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Around a year ago in California, a couple were doing a gender reveal party. For those who maybe don't know what that is, essentially it's a popular thing today amongst some, that when a, a lady is expecting, the couple will have a party and they will reveal with some type of device, either a blue collar or a pink collar, blue for a boy, pink for a girl. This couple in California did just as such, and they had a great party. And they had a firework and some different things to make smoke. Well, one of them went off. 
and started a small fire that went on to become a wildfire that spread over 22,000 acres, destroyed homes, cost the life of one of the firemen, and lasted for over two months did such a fire burn. Here, as he describes the destructive power, the sinful and evil power of the tongue, he says it is like a small fire that once it catches, burns down an entire forest. Do you see, brother, sister, friend who is with us this evening, the incredible evil power of human words? It is as a fire, small, but that sets ablaze a mighty forest. And then verse 6, now abandoning in a sense the metaphor and saying it just as it is, as James is wont to, for he is certainly direct, and the tongue is a fire. He describes it in the first clause in verse 6 as a world of unrighteousness, a world of evil. He says that it is set or sets itself among our parts of the body, And then he says it stains the whole body. You'll remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. Because what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. Such every place the tongue touches in our bodies, in that sense, and our lives, it leaves the stain of sin and its defilement. Indeed, this is a serious matter. It stains the whole body, he says. And then he says it sets on fire, setting on fire the entire course of life. Again, that idea of a fire that catches and spreads its deadly power. And then he closes verse 6 with these words, speaking of the tongue, that it is set on fire by hell. Here, what he's referring to, by hell, the place reserved for Satan and demons, He's referring to Satan himself. That the the tongue is such a destructive force, so evil and sinful in its ways, that when we sin with our tongues, we are following the encouragement, the enticement of Satan himself. You'll remember the Lord Jesus said of him that he is a liar and the father of all lies. You see, he wants us to not believe the truth and instead to believe lies and to speak lies. So it is that the power of the tongue, it is our responsibility, but we are walking in the way of Satan himself. The word hell here referencing the one who, it, who is the one going to go there, as indeed with all the demons and all the wicked, but here referencing Satan such that wicked speech is it indeed satanic. That is the point. And this is not hyperbole, this is the truth. This is the danger of the tongue. What a warning. And then in verses 7 and 8, he will show that the tongue is not controllable by human beings, not in ourselves. We cannot fully subdue, domesticate, master, control the tongue. Look in verse 7. He now refers to the dominion given to men and women, human beings, back in Genesis. He says, for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by humankind. He's here referring to when God says to have dominion to human beings over every part of the animal kingdom. And so when he's talking of the taming, he's saying taking from a state of uncontrolled to a state of being controlled. So this has begun when our dominion was given to us in the garden and continues to this day. For all manner of creatures, humans are still subduing, domesticating, and taming. Notice the uh, four-category definition, meaning all of the animal kingdom. We can, and it refers to the fact that we have and continue to. But what of the tongue? Verse 8, now the comparison. But no human being can tame the tongue. James says it is a restless, an uncontrollable, unstable evil, full of deadly poison. Here, undoubtedly alluding to Psalm 143 that says, Of the wicked, they make their tongue sharp as a serpent's, and under their lips is the venom of asps. It is indeed an apt description of the tongue. Unless we think this is all in high metaphor, 
Let's bring it down to earth. Let's bring it closer to home. How deadly is the tongue? Consider your life. Consider your words. How often a disagreement, just two differences of opinions, turns into a heated argument so quickly, so readily. Insults are quickly exchanged, and all this through the tongue. It is a deadly and awful thing. Restless evil, he says, full of deadly poison. Think of a snake, a poisonous snake, that if bitten causes death in the one it bites. Such is the power of the tongue. And then 9 through 12, here he will talk to the especial evil, or maybe show the evil of the tongue in an especially obvious way, through its doubleness, saying one thing, but then also doing and saying its opposite. But here he won't just show the doubleness of the tongue. He will end by calling us as Christians, he calls the Christians he writes to here, to live out our transformed hearts, to live out our salvation in the area of our words, to actually by the power of Christ, by grace alone, to grow in controlling our tongues and instead to use our tongues to glorify God. Look with me at verse 9. He says here, the doubleness, with it we bless our Lord, that is to praise God, to sing hymns, to say that God is great and declare him great. But what else? With the same tongue we curse people. Cursing people is not merely using bad language. This is a very serious thing. It is, in effect, to say, damn you. It is to proclaim damnation on a person. To to say, God, remove any chance of blessing from them and consign them to hell. Such is a curse. This is what the ancients understood, and it's what's meant by this word. You may not say those exact words, but think of what's behind it. When we lose our rag, when we get upset with a person, how quick we are to insults and even to say words to the effect of damn you. And he says the reason this is so awful is because not only are we invoking God to judge, that's not our place, it's also awful because we say this, we curse people who are made in God's image. Hence it is wrong. It is incompatible with the life of a changed heart. It is inconsistent. It is not living out one's true self, the new man, the new woman in Christ. It is instead going according to the flesh. Such it is to sin with words. And he says in 10, explaining what he's just explained in, said in 9, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, and by extension my brothers and sisters, says James, these things ought not to be so. Could not be any clearer, could it? To do this is inconsistent with a Christian changed heart by grace in Christ. And he closes out the passage, verses 11 and 12, with a series of illustrations. And here the point is, brother, sister, live out, produce according to your true nature. In the natural world, he's going to show examples where like produces like. This again was well understood by the ancients, that things produce according to their kind, according to their nature. So the principle here for us and for his first readers, believers here, is live out your true nature in Christ Jesus, the transformed, renewed heart by grace, and do that with your words. Verse 11, does a spring, so important in the dry climate of Palestine, indeed, without water, villages wouldn't exist. There needs to be not just water, but fresh water. And so he says, does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? He's not asking because he doesn't know. It's a rhetorical question. It's an assumed answer. No, it doesn't. The spring produces according to its nature. Second, verse 12, 
Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? The answer, no. The tree produces according to its nature. It produces fruit according to its kind. And lastly, neither can a salt pond or a salt spring yield fresh water. Here framed negatively in the third illustration. So as to say, if your heart is not right with God through Christ, by faith, you cannot produce pure words. You cannot. Only a transformed heart can produce consistently pure words that honour God. That's what's needed. And only through that can one honour God with our speech. And so these verses do indeed call his first readers to honour God, to live out your real and true man and woman in Christ, here specifically with our words. So that is our text. What should we do in response? Well, we are called, I believe, brothers and sisters, to recognise and then respond. First, if you are not a follower of Christ tonight, do you recognise, when you evaluate your words, how wicked they are? Even when you try to do something potentially good, still our words cause so much harm. Aren't they so harmful and destructive? What this shows, if you're not a believer, is the reality that you need Christ. And can I call you to come to God, to come to God specifically to Jesus Christ, to trust him, to turn from living for yourself and know that you belong to him by grace because your sins have been dealt with and you have new life. You are a new creation in Jesus through his resurrection. I call you this evening, friend, to trust him. Because the end, as we've seen in this passage, of a life lived, sinning in speech, living for self, is hell. It is to go to that place prepared for Satan and his angels. Such, Revelation 20 tells us, is the destiny of all who reject Jesus. Do not delay. Turn and trust him right now. I would love nothing more than to chat with you this evening any of us who know Christ and have been saved by him, to talk to you of the wonder of God's transforming power in Jesus. And then what for us believers? Well, we are called also to recognise and respond first and obviously the evil power of the tongue. We must take this seriously. A theologian of a bygone age, John Owen, said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. How right he was. Brother, sister, we must also yet recognise that we have been saved by grace. We are new creatures in Christ and we are called to live that out. We must keep our eyes fixed on him, our eyes fixed on the grace of God that continues to bless us, the Spirit's sanctifying power, and thus control our tongues by Christ's power, and thus use our words to glorify God and not to tear others down. And along with that, can I encourage you to regularly take time and prayerfully reflect on your words. Even this past week, what words have you spoken that were evil, that were sinful, that were wrong, said in haste, said in anger? Can I encourage you to turn to God in prayer? Repent. Find the person you spoke that to. Apologize. Reconcile. Know the forgiveness of Christ and reconcile relationships. Surely this text calls us to take sinful speech seriously and because of the power of our risen Lord to not sin with our speech, to grow in controlling the tongue and glorifying Christ with our mouths. As I close, I'd like to read some verses. There are a selection of verses from the book of Proverbs that talk of the power of words. And as I end, we're going to move to a time of open prayer. So that's a time for you to pray, to pray simply, to pray short prayers so that many others can pray, to ask God for help. Remember the words, indeed, 
of David in Psalm 141. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. If it's good enough for David, it's good enough for us. Let us pray exactly that way, that God would help us to guard our lips and our mouths, that we would not sin in speech. Hear these words, and then we'll go to a time of open prayer. When words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Whoever belittles his neighbour lacks sense. But a man of understanding remains silent. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. And lastly, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Let's turn to prayer.